This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome to the podcast of Man Library's Chats in the Stacks book talk series. In today's talk, originally given at Man Library on October 27, 2011, Cornell Professor of Policy Analysis and Management John Cauley discusses his new book, The Social Science of Obesity. Presenting a comprehensive survey of obesity-related research across the full range of social sciences, from anthropology to economics and psychology to government, Dr. Cauley's book is a critical reference for public health officials, policymakers, nutritionists, and medical practitioners. So I'm really uh, happy to talk with you today about this new uh, book, The Oxford Handbook of the Social Science of Obesity. And unlike a monograph, which is the work of just one person usually, uh, this is the work of very many people. And I hope to be able to convey to you today uh, all the people that were involved that made this possible. Because uh, many cooks went into uh, preparing this. And I'm just the lucky one who gets to stand here today and, and take credit for it somewhat. So what I wanted to do today was start out by just first motivating why is obesity uh, something worth devoting 900 pages to. Uh, in particular, I wanted to talk about the trends in obesity, both in the United States and worldwide, and then the consequences of obesity. Why should we care that obesity is increasing so rapidly? Uh, then I wanted to give you a sense of just what the book is about, what's contained in there. So I'll describe for you the major sections and try to give you a, f uh, a sense of the content and describe for you, for example, the economic perspective on obesity and how it differs from the perspectives of other social sciences and from uh, public health advocates as well. And I'll also highlight some of the more interesting findings, some of the sort of surprising things contained within the book. And then finally, I thought it'd be fun just to talk a little bit about uh, producing the book, like working with the publisher, the actual nuts and bolts of having, uh, of, of making a book like this and having it come out and seeing it marketed and sold. And at any time, please do feel free to ask questions. And I think there should be some extra time at the end, but I'm also very receptive to people, uh, you know, just indicating with a hand or, or any kind of motion that they have a question at, the, at the, any given time. So just to motivate why obesity, um, you might think really generally, why do we care about the risky health behaviors of individuals to begin with? Well, if you want to take a historical perspective, back in 1900 and the years prior to that, the things that killed most people were infectious diseases and poor sanitation. So, uh, for example, in 1900, the top four causes of death in the United States were pneumonia, influenza, tuberculosis, and diarrhea. And between 1900 and 2000, a really dramatic transformation took place, not just in the United States, but in many other developed countries. And that transformation has been called the epidemiologic transition. And what that refers to is a movement from the causes of death being infectious and sanitation related to a situation where the things that we die of are our own choices. We're dying now predominantly of our own risky health behaviors. So when you look at the actual causes of death, in the United States in the year 2000, as calculated by the CDC. And so just to clarify what I mean by actual causes of death, these won't be the things that end up on your death certificate, like myocardial infarction or heart attack, but the CDC traces those um, uh, deaths back to specific choices. The number one preventable cause of death in the United States is tobacco, smoking. It kills uh, 435,000 people a year. The number two cause of death is obesity, or in other words, poor diet and physical inactivity. And that's responsible for another 365,000 deaths per year. Number three is also a risky health behavior, consumption of alcohol. And then further down the list, you see uh, sexual behavior, so unprotected sex, HIV transmission, uh, and illicit drug use. So that's a really stark change from the year 1900. And it really indicates that if you're interested in population health, if you're interested in understanding sources of mortality in developed countries, you really need to think about the decisions that individuals make that involve risky behaviors. So obesity in particular is the risky health behavior that I spend most of my time studying. And so it sort of makes sense to start off by first defining what I mean by obesity. So the most generally accepted uh, way of measuring obesity is using body mass index, or BMI. And that's measured or calculated as your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. And if your BMI is equal to or greater than 25, then you're clinically overweight. And if your BMI is greater than or equal to 30, then you're clinically obese. Those standards are for adults. 
For children, there's been a lot more debate about how to define obesity, because children sometimes gain weight before they have a growth spurt, and it can be really hard to classify children in terms of whether they're really at health risk or not based on their weight for height. But one of the, one of the accepted measures is to define a child as overweight, or to classify them as overweight if their BMI exceeds the historic 85th percentile for weight, say from back in the 1960s. And then children today are going to be considered obese if their weight, is, weight for height is above the 95th percentile of weight for height back from the 1960s. But uh, personally, I have problems with that definition of obesity because BMI is just pounds divided by height, right? And what those pounds are constituted by matters. It matters whether your pounds are muscle and bone and lean mass and liquid, or if it's fat. But BMI just ignores that. And the reason that BMI is sort of the standard measure of fatness in epidemiology and medicine goes back to decisions made decades ago when the field of, uh, re you know, the field of research that's really focused on obesity was confronted with this decision of how do we define fatness and obesity, and for the sake of convenience, they chose BMI because it was easy to measure. All you have to do is put somebody on a scale, and you've got the numerator, you use a tape measure and get their height, and you've got the denominator, and you're done. Um, but over time, with the progression of technology, it's become possible to much more accurately measure a person's percent body fat. And I personally think that makes a lot more sense. Um, and ways that you can do this include bioelectrical impedance analysis, and this um, involves sending very low levels of electricity into your body, and under the logic that fat is an insulator, and lean body mass is mostly liquid, so therefore it's a conductor, and so therefore the resistance that your body presents to these low levels of electricity can be used to measure how much fat a person has in their body. And so at conferences, I've gotten to stand on these more advanced BIA devices where you grip handles and stand on uh, metal pads with your socks off, and they'll not only tell you your percent body fat, but they'll tell you limb by limb and in your trunk, like where you have fat deposited. And I still don't know why I'm asymmetric, like why one leg has more fat than another, <laughs> but it's actually possible. And really, uh, medical researchers are increasingly using direct measures of fatness instead of BMI. So researchers who study the probability of heart attack or my myocardial infarction are increasingly finding that uh, measures of central fatness, like waist circumference, or percent body fat predict heart attacks much more accurately than just BMI. But something that's a little frustrating is that um, many other researchers continue to use BMI because it's the historic standard. Um, although in work that we've done, we found that um, what measure you use matters a lot. So for example, BMI makes racial disparities in obesity seem twice as large as they actually are. So African Americans tend to have greater lean mass for the same height, and as a result, if you're using BMI, it looks like African American women have an enormously higher prevalence of obesity than, Afri uh, than white women, but in fact, when you use percent body fat, that gap is much, much less. It's about half. So you know, how we choose to define the problem that we're studying can have enormous implications for you know, how we perceive even racial differences. So obesity has risen uh, very dramatically in the last few decades. So this graph is showing you the trends in youth obesity, and the blue line is showing you the percentage of youths uh, that are defined, whose obesity is defined using BMI, and the red line is showing you the percent of youths who are obese when you use percent body fat. And so in this case, there might be a difference in levels, but there isn't a big difference in the trend. So no matter which of these two measures you use, clearly obesity has risen dramatically among, in, among youth in the United States. And so while back in the mid-1960s, the prevalence of obesity among youths was under 15% when you use BMI, it's now about 33%. So more than a doubling of youth obesity uh, just since the mid-1960s. And adults, too, have experienced a very dramatic rise in obesity. Uh, around 1960, if you use BMI as your standard, uh, just under 15% of adults in the United States were obese. Uh, now it's 33%. So again, a doubling of obesity uh, in, among U.S. adults. So I also wanted to show you some of the geographic disparities in obesity in the United States, as well as give you a sense of how quickly obesity rose uh, during the time period that I'm talking about. So this is showing you data from the uh, Centers for Disease Control, and it's collected using a data set called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. So this is a phone-based uh, survey. So they just call up a randomly selected uh, sample of each state's population, and they simply ask them over the phone what their height and weight are, and they use that to, to calculate BMI. So that's imperfect. So the, these graphs I was showing you before, this is from a nationally representative survey where people are actually measured, 
which is much more accurate because, not surprisingly, people tend to lie about their weight. And the heavier someone is, the greater the lie tends to be, the greater the underreport tends to be. So the data that you're going to see reflected in this map, uh, they are a, you know, a significant underestimate of the prevalences of obesity in the United States. But it's still useful data to use because it's collected every single year. So in, in real time, in continuous time, you can actually see how uh, obesity is changing in the United States. So this is the map from 1985. Uh, so these graphs that I started with, they go back to 1960. This is just going back 25 years. And the states that are indicated in white, all that that means is that they didn't conduct the survey in that state yet. Um, the light blue color to a state means that the prevalence of obesity using that self-reported weight and height is under 10%. And if it's the darker shade of blue, then the prevalence of adult obesity is between 10 and 14%. So what I'm going to do is just click through the uh, annual maps that just show you the prevalence of obesity by state to give you, again, a sense of both the geographic disparities and the speed with which obesity has increased in the United States. Uh, so that's 85, 86, 87, 88. So more states are getting darker, right, indicating that obesity is rising. 91. Now we, went, now we need a new category. Uh, so the new category is a prevalence of adult ob obesity between 15 and 19 percent. Each click is one year. Now we need another new category. So now the, the yellow means a prevalence of adult obesity that's over 20%. Oh, another category again, uh, obesity over 25%. Another category, obesity over 30%. And so you can see now um, that there's no states in the categories that we first saw was the, was the highest cat. There's no states in the category that was the highest category back in 1985. Every single state is well beyond that. Uh, the state with the lowest prevalence of obesity is Colorado, and that's been true in just about every survey that's been conducted. The highest prevalence of obesity tends to be in the states of the former Confederacy um, and sort of rural, like sort of Ozarks, Appalachia. So only recently has the federal government started collecting surveillance data on obesity at such a fine level that we can actually see county by county what the prevalence of obesity looks like. And so this is the most recent data, uh, again, th through telephone survey. So these are underestimates of the true prevalence of obesity. And so you can see there are these enormous, even county-level variations in obesity. Again, Colorado stands out as uh, you know, having the lowest rate of prevalence of obesity. But even in New York State, as you can see, uh, the counties right near the city have low rates of obesity. Uh, the North Country has higher, uh, and so on. But if you're looking at states like Louisiana, uh, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, Tennessee, almost the entire state has counties in the highest category of obesity. And it's not just the U.S. that experienced this rise in obesity. It's really uh, virtually every developed country, and you could almost say every country on Earth. So this is showing you for uh, a variety of developed countries the trajectory of obesity over the last few decades. And the US is a, a remarkable uh, leader in collecting surveillance data uh, regarding obesity and other public health problems. So other countries really didn't start regularly collecting data like this until relatively recently. So they, we just can't go as far back as we can with the US. Um, I guess we're also a leader in obesity itself. So that's us at the top there, the, the, dark, the dark red line, with the highest prevalence of overweight. And then you can see other developed countries in Europe and Asia uh, are also following similar parallel trajectories. And I just want to point out that this graph, which is from a, a paper that was published in The Lancet a few weeks ago, the last two data points are their projections of what's going to happen in the future. Prior to that, they're, they're actual data points. And this is a map to just give you a sense of where we are now worldwide. So I think you've all probably heard the, uh, uh, that the US is the fattest nation on Earth. And there's considerable truth to that. Uh, but this is showing you for um, categories of overweight that we're not alone in having a very high percentage of our population that is, a, that is overweight. So the, in the US currently, 2 thirds of all adult Americans are clinically overweight. They have a BMI of greater than or equal to 25. So the dark red category here is uh, showing you that this country has a prevalence of overweight that's greater than 60% of the adult population. So we're not alone in that. Mexico, Canada, Argentina, Chile, South Africa, the Middle East, uh, parts of Europe, but interestingly, not all of Europe. 
uh, Australia and New Zealand. That's the data for men. If you look at the data for women, it's slightly different. Australia and Canada are no longer in the highest category. Uh, there's no country in Europe that's in the highest category anymore by these, uh, by these data which come from the World Health Organization. Um, but in terms of the, the Middle East, US, Mexico, South Africa, Chile, and Argentina, uh, men and women are quite similar. So uh, I think the next logical question is, OK, why should we care? So people are getting heavier. The prevalence of obesity is rising dramatically, doubling in this country in the last few decades. Uh, what does that mean for public health? So uh, you know, many years ago, I, I used to think of fat as just being this extra stuff we carried around. right? Like when you eat too much, fat grows, and you walk around with it, and it's just there. It makes you heavier. Uh, but actually, fat is collectively an organ that secretes hormones, and those hormones do destructive things to our bodies. So specifically, fat releases uh, resistin, which is a hormone that leads to insulin resistance and therefore the development of type 2 diabetes. And uh, it also releases leptin, which causes cardiovascular disease. So this is the biological pathway whereby uh, obesity leads to type 2 diabetes, poor circulation, sometimes blindness, amputation of limbs, uh, can lead to heart attacks, stroke. Uh, obesity has also been linked to cancer. So because of these biological mechanisms, there is elevated mortality and morbidity among obese individuals. There's also higher health care costs. And there's also implications for labor market activity, lower productivity, job absenteeism, and so on. Um, but interestingly, there's also a set of consequences that have nothing to do with the biological pathways. And those relate to social pathways, to how, we're, how, uh, how in obese individuals are treated by the rest of society. So there are well-documented consequences for mental health and self-esteem that are greater for women than men, and even among women are greater for white females than for African American or Hispanic females who report having different ideal body sizes and shapes. There's also uh, labor market discrimination. Uh, there are studies that have documented discrimination in uh, the healthcare system against individuals who are obese. Um, in terms of those medical care costs of obesity, I wanted to give you the most recent estimates of the, of the cost. In, in, the, in some work that we just had uh, accepted by the Journal of Health Economics, we calculated that obesity is responsible in the United States for $190 billion a year in elevated health care costs. If you uh, look at per obese individual, that works out to over $2,741 above and beyond what a healthy weight person uh, incurs in health care costs in a given year. So what that means is that either directly or indirectly, obesity is responsible for about 20% of our total US national health expenditures. Because obesity can make treating basically every other condition more expensive. So for example, think of surgery and the complications that are incurred with respect to anesthesia when someone's obese and may have sleep apnea, asthma, uh, the complications that can result, uh, the difficulties in um, uh, rehabilitation for that person, an additional stay in the hospital, all these things add up. There's also consequences in the labor market. It's estimated that obese, uh, obese white females earn 11.2% less than healthy white, white females with the same education, uh, job tenure, and so on. Uh, obese individuals also miss work more for health-related reasons, and that totals $4.3 billion a year in the United States. And there's also considerable social stigma, including, including things like a lower probability of marriage. So, as obesity has doubled in the last 30 years, another consequence is that the amount of research that's done on obesity has risen exponentially in the last few decades. So I first started working on the economics of obesity when I was in graduate school in the, in the late 1990s. And uh, at that time, there was literally almost no work being done on that in this, at that time. So what this graph shows you are data from different uh, search indexes uh, that are online. So EconLit is an index of all the papers published in economics. Uh, PAIS indexes the articles and books published in public affairs. Socabstracts is for sociology, and PsychInfo is for psychology. And so back in 1998, the EconLit uh, was showing basically one article a year uh, was coming out in economics journals on obesity. And now in 2009, 2010, it's about 140 a year. So in, in percentage terms, that's uh, an enormous increase. And so we've seen similar increases for public affairs, uh, for psychology. So this is the axis that corresponds to psychology. Psychology's always done more work on obesity than these other social sciences. And then this is the index that corresponds to the other three search indices. Um, but for all of these social sciences, there's been just an exponential increase in the amount of research being done on obesity, which is a good thing. 
but it also represents a real challenge for researchers because how do you stay up to date on all the latest findings? And this isn't even listing the medical journal articles that are published on obesity, which number in the hundreds, if not thousands, every single year. So that's the point of the book. So the point of the book is, um, first of all, as Mary mentioned, to provide a Rosetta Stone. So the different social science disciplines can talk to each other and understand what they're working on and benefit from each other's advances. And another per point of the book is just to allow people to stay up to date on these very large and fast-moving literatures. So what I wanted to make possible was for an economist to say, I want to learn what's being done uh, on obesity in sociology, and I want to be able to figure that out in like three hours, right, or two hours. Uh, and I want to do the same for psychology, for epidemiology, uh, and so on. So let me describe how the book is laid out for you. Uh, so that's the, the cover. Uh, it's got 47 chapters by a total of 87 contributors, and it was just published last year by Oxford University Press. So the guiding principles of the handbook um, include the following. First of all, that obesity is inherently a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary issue. So there's no one discipline that has all the answers as far as obesity is concerned. Obesity does have economic aspects. Think of agriculture policy that changes food prices, food advertising. It definitely also has psychological aspects, right? So when somebody's thinking about eating chocolate chip cookies, they might be thinking about how in childhood mom made them chocolate chip cookies and it made them feel happy, and that's affecting their diet today. There's also sociological aspects of obesity, so peer effects. I take my cues from what my family and my neighbors are doing, um, and so on. And so uh, no, in isolation, no discipline can, can make uh, the important contributions that I think solving or addressing the problem of obesity requires. And just to clarify, I think working within a discipline has its advantages. There's benefits to that because you can really focus on a specific direction and a subset of topics. You have a common language that you can use to communicate with other people in your discipline. There's reasons that we have these silos called disciplines. But at the same time, there's disadvantages to that. There's trade-offs. And those include just an inability to share information. So sometimes two disciplines use different words for the same thing. And even more confusingly, sometimes they use the same word to mean two different things or uh, uh, did I say that right? Two words to mean the same thing and, this, and one word to mean two different things. Uh, and so this is, there's also the possibility or the risk that we're missing really important breakthroughs just because the right people aren't talking to each other. And it's really hard to find who the right people are that you should be talking to. So as was mentioned, being a Rosetta Stone was one guide, allow people to understand each other's disciplines. And really the ultimate objective is to facilitate discussion, encourage people working in these different disciplinary silos to learn what each other are doing and just to talk more and hopefully down the road to collaborate more. And to achieve this, it was really important to me to get the absolute best researchers in the world to write chapters that summarize their topic of expertise. And I'm really happy to say that uh, I was just shocked by the willingness of people to do that. And I think it's, it relates to that concept that Malcolm Gladwell called the tipping point. Like once you have enough um, sort of people really famous for their accomplishments on board, everybody wants to be part of that project as well because the, the value is not in terms of money. Uh, the value is in terms of being part of something that's going to be seen as a really important reference. Um, so the first part of the book has summaries of different disciplinary perspectives on obesity. So how does this discipline uh, ask questions. How do they model human behavior as concerns diet and physical activity and obesity? And one thing that all of these social sciences have in common is that they're interested in a better understanding the decisions of individuals. Why do people engage in the behaviors they engage in? And that's really important for understanding health in this age of the, after the epidemiologic transition. So we have a chapter on epidemiology from Aviva Must, uh, epidemiology being the study of disease and how it spreads and its correlates. And demography, uh, the chapter was written by Chris Himes at Syracuse, demography being the study of population dynamics. Uh, Cleometrics is a field you might not have heard of. It's the application of uh, modern statistics to historical questions. And so this is a chapter that goes and mines old data sets, very often army records, and uh, reports what we can learn about changes over time in weight and height based on you know, um, evidence of, from convicts and from soldiers drafted in the French Revolution and so on. A uh, chapter in anthropology was contributed by uh, Penny Gordon Larson. Uh, chapters in psychology, sociology, which I'm happy to say was contributed by Jeff Sobel, who's my colleague here at Cornell in the Division of Nutrition. I wrote the chapter on economics. 
behavioral economics is a discipline that looks at the intersection or overlap between psychology and economics. Economics tends to have a rational choice view of human behavior, and behavioral economics relaxes some of those strong assumptions to allow for people to have quirks where they're not behaving like you know, rational choice uh, robots. That might be the critique of the very strong microeconomic model. We have a chapter on uh, the politics of obesity, which describes the contributions from political science. That was written by Rogan Kirsch of NYU and Jim Marone of Brown. And then a chapter on fat studies, which is sort of like a postmodernist uh, discipline that questions a lot of the assumptions in these other social sciences that was written by Esther Rothblum. So I wanted to just uh, to give you a little bit of a flavor for how different disciplines view dietary and physical activity behaviors, and therefore why different disciplines might have different perspectives on obesity. So let me just describe for you in very, very briefly the economic model. So the economic model, as I mentioned before, is a rational choice model. So e economists model human behavior as if people were trying to make themselves as happy as possible, maximize their utility, uh, given the constraints that they face. And we all face constraints with respect to time and money. Um, and we ha our happiness is determined by a variety of things, including the foods we eat, the quality and quantity of those foods, the physical activity we engage in, our past behaviors. So running a marathon today feels horrible if I haven't run a mile in the past year, but it feels really good potentially if I run marathons every month. And people get utility out of how they spend their time, like watching TV. So economists assume that people um, observe these constraints that they face. They look at the prices that different activities and foods cost, and then they allocate their scarce time and money in such a way as to maximize their happiness. Now, a really important implication of this is that when prices change or when certain activities become more enjoyable, then people will change their diets and change their physical activity to take into account those new trade-offs. So, for example, you can think an economic uh, answer to the question of why obesity might have risen would be that if you look back at 1960, there were only three or four channels on your television set, and your television set screen was that big, and now there's 200 channels on your television set, and you have a 52-inch widescreen HD TV. So in other words, watching TV just became a lot more enjoyable, and so people rationally chose to do more TV watching. So some of the sort of uh, interesting implications that come out of this model include that people may rationally accept a higher body weight in exchange for other things that they value. So in the economic model, people are just trying to maximize their happiness. They're not necessarily trying to maximize their longevity. And so as a result, just as I chose to drive to work today because it would save me time and allow me to get more work done, I, I accepted an elevated risk of a car crash which could have killed me. So I am willing to accept risks to my health if I get other things that I value from that risk. And the same thing's true with respect to obesity. So people can rationally say, I'm going to have dessert. I know it's not good for my health necessarily. It might add to my weight, but I really enjoy dessert and I'm going to have it today. Um, along those same lines, the fact that a person is clinically overweight or even obese is not evidence or proof that the person is irrational. So I think sometimes in the public health community, there's, there's this belief that you know, no one who's obese could possibly you know, have rationally chosen the activities that led them to that position. But if you accept that people know their constraints, they know the trade-offs they face, and that they can make informed decisions, then we can sort of relax that really strong conclusion and think like maybe people know something that we don't. Like maybe the reason that that single mom who's trying to raise three kids while working a job, maybe the reason she's heavy is because she doesn't want to cook from scratch every night. She'd rather spend her precious time with her kids. And it doesn't so, sound so irrational when you think of it in terms of the constraints that people face. So from the economic point of view, if you want to understand obesity, you need to understand why people think it's optimal for them to engage in the dietary patterns and the physical activity patterns that led them to being overweight or obese. So simply telling people that they should behave differently isn't predicted to have any effect in the economic model. If you want people to change their behavior, if you want people to lose weight, to eat better, be more physically active, you have to change the trade-offs. You have to change the prices that they face, and then they will rationally respond. So as I mentioned, this is a, this is a very very much at odds with the public health perspective. The public health perspective is sort of that people should behave in order to maximize their longevity and maximize their health. So whereas an economist would say, I can accept that someone would accept worse health in exchange for other things that they value, implicitly public health seems to be arguing that you should not do things that will reduce your longevity or that will impair your health. Uh, another big difference is that frequently um, public health officials or advocates 
want to make sort of express normative opinions about what people should be doing, where economics really tries to stick to what are people doing without making express prescriptions about what people should be doing. So there's a wide variety of differences in the way that economists view these questions uh, with, uh, that are at odds with the way public health, public health advocates view these questions. But the same thing's true for other social sciences as well. So we can compare the different social sciences in terms of what are the key factors that they study when they think about dietary patterns and physical activity. So as I mentioned, economists study the role of incentives and trade-offs of all kinds. You can think of sociologists as studying the role of society and family and peers and social norms. Demographers tend to study the life course, aging, uh, gender, race, and ethnicity. Psychologists study a wide variety of uh, factors, including depression and mental health, uh, you know, neurobiology, brain chemistry, advertising and marketing, media, norms in society, and anthropologists study the role of culture. And as I mentioned before, obesity is inherently a multidisciplinary problem. There's nothing on that right-hand column that you would cross off to say that it's irrelevant to people's decision-making and irrelevant to obesity. And that's why I think we needed to have a volume like this so that we could all quickly get up to speed on what's the state-of-the-art knowledge on the contributions of all these different uh, factors to the problem of obesity. The second, so the first part of the book concerns the different disciplinary perspectives on obesity. Uh, the second part of the book is written expressly for researchers, so people who want to you know, engage in primary data analysis. And so there's a chapter that lists in great detail all the publicly available data that you can literally just go on the internet and download and start working with if you want to study the question of obesity. There's a chapter on a very cutting edge topic which is complex system science. And so this is, uh, it's almost sort of a transdisciplinary view that everything matters. And that if you want to tackle the problem of obesity, you need to tackle schools, communities, um, uh, you know, individual decisions, you need to work with the business community, government has to be involved. And so what that implies is that if you want to construct a, a statistical model of obesity, you need to take into account a really exhaustive set of factors, which is incredibly complicated to do, and which is why you, know, you need a chapter like this to sort of walk you through the steps. And then finally, there's a chapter on the challenges for identifying causal effects. So in general, uh, one of the real problems in doing research on obesity is that we can't do randomized experiments. Right? So you think of a, a clinical application, you think of a new drug that the FDA is considering approving, if they want to know what effect the drug has, they just get a big group of people, they randomize them to the treatment and control group, and they give the drug to the treatment group and see how their outcomes differ relative to the control group. Uh, we can't do that. We can't randomize people to a control group and force them to be obese so we can observe whether they're discriminated against and whether they have a heart attack. And so that makes it really hard to figure out what are, the, what are the causes of obesity and what are the consequences of obesity? And so very frequently people can estimate correlations, uh, but we want to know this much more uh, fundamental question about the causes and consequences. And so this chapter describes some of the statistical techniques that people can use to answer those important questions. Part three focuses on the causes and correlates of diet, physical activity, and obesity. Uh, issues like race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, meaning income and education, uh, the nutrition transition, which is this evolution over time where countries used to have a large number of people who were underweight and stunted to the situation now where we have most people who are overweight. The role of peer effects, so am I influenced by my neighbors and the rest of my family uh, in terms of my diet and physical activity. The role of maternal employment in childhood obesity. Uh, mental health and depression, advertising and video games. Uh, portion size effects, so Barbara Rolls, who contributed this chapter, is uh, really one of the leading researchers in documenting that when you give people a larger portion size, they'll tend to eat more, and it's an incredibly robust finding. Uh, Brian Wansink, our colleague here at Cornell, contributed a chapter on mindless eating, where he, uh, obviously he's the world expert in that area. Uh, food assistance, so the role of food stamps, uh, school lunches, the WIC program, uh, we have a chapter devoted to that. The built environment, so for example, does the fact that a lot of modern housing developments lack sidewalks, does that contribute to obesity because people can't walk uh, you know, just around the neighborhood for fun, there's no commercial district to walk to, what's the evidence on the, the role of the built environment in all of this? Uh, food deserts refers to the question of whether an absence of grocery stores that sell fresh fruits and vegetables can contribute to rising obesity in poor uh, areas. The role of food prices and income and agriculture policy. The fourth section of the book is focused on the consequences of obesity, including medical care costs, like I mentioned before, uh, mortality, schooling, uh, job market, jo labor market outcomes like wages, disability, job absenteeism, 
uh, discrimination, and the author of that chapter is the, the world expert on the topic from Yale University, Rebecca Poole. And then uh, we have a sort of contrarian chapter by Abigail Segui and Paul Campos, where they question, really, whether the harms of obesity are as great as is typically claimed. Then finally, part five really takes everything that we've already talked about and asks, how can we use this to inform prevention and treatment? And so we have chapters uh, from Kelly Brownell at Yale on how we can change uh, policy, government policy, to reduce or prevent obesity, economic perspectives on obesity policy. Is there anything we can learn from the public health campaign against tobacco, which is now wide, uh, widely recognized as a, as a success story? Uh, prevalence of smoking has dropped dramatically since the 1960s. Uh, the state attorneys general won a lawsuit against the tobacco companies, uh, resulting in the master settlement agreement. And so it's perceived that the, the tobacco wars were won by the public health community. And so what can we learn about uh, from the tobacco wars that can be applied to uh, the efforts to prevent and reduce obesity. Whether food taxes, in particular soda pop taxes, make sense as a chapter. Uh, School-based interventions, increased physical activity, reforming school lunches. Workplace obesity prevention programs is the subject of another chapter because the quirky way that we provide health insurance in this country through employers means that uh, individual employers have an incentive to improve the health of their workers. Because if they can get workers to quit smoking and be healthy, lose weight, then that firm can save on health insurance premiums because the employer is you know, providing or sponsoring the health insurance. And so increasingly, a lot of different employers are trying some really innovative things in the workplace to incentivize and reward healthy behaviors by employees. Community interventions, there's places like Philadelphia, Somerville, New York City, where uh, you know, city governments are taking enormous initiatives and making huge investments to try and make people more physically active and eat better. Uh, a paper, uh, sorry, a chapter is contributed by Pauline Polito of the Federal Trade Commission looking at possible ways that we can regulate food advertising to better protect children. Sahara Byrne and Jeff Niederdepi, who are in the Cornell Communications Department, contributed a really nice chapter that I haven't seen uh, really addressed anywhere else, which is about unintended consequences of public health messages. And so what they're looking at is this phenomenon um, that's related to the fact that the government is a much less experienced advertiser than industry is. So when industry puts together a food ad, they're pretty effective. When the government tries to put together an, uh, an obesity prevention ad aimed at kids, it might be so ham-handed that it makes eating a healthy diet look uncool. And so uh, what could result is what Jeff and Sahara call a backlash or boomerang effects, where the public health message, because it's poorly designed, actually has the opposite result that was, was intended by the government. And then we have uh, also uh, chapters on medical treatments for obesity and how social science can inform those. Uh, so for example, anti-obesity drugs, bariatric surgery, and the cost effectiveness of different anti-obesity interventions. So I also wanted to just give you a flavor of some of the things uh, that surprised me. So some of the more unusual or counterintuitive findings that are contained in these different chapters. So for example, uh, Virginia Chang at the University of Pennsylvania and Neil Mehta contributed a chapter on mortality and obesity, and they document some really interesting patterns. So first of all, in the last few decades, the mortality penalty that's associated with obesity, and what I mean by that is the elevated risk of, obe uh, of, of death that's associated with being obese, that's been falling. Uh, over the past few decades. And so it's not clear if the type of person who is obese has changed or medical treatment and prevention has improved so much that it's not such a bad thing to be obese anymore, or at least not as bad as it used to be. Right? So if you think of in the 1940s, being an obese male was probably a death sentence. Right? You're probably going to have a heart attack and die. Today we have cholesterol-busting drugs. We can do bypass surgery. We can do all sorts of things to prevent the person from ever having the heart attack. And so obesity has become less harmful. What's also really interesting is that they document that it's not all obese people who face an elevated risk of mortality. It's only the extreme obese. So people whose BMI is between 30 and 35 have no higher risk of mortality than people who are healthy weight. It's people whose BMIs are really 35 and above where the mortality risk takes off considerably. And the same thing's true for overweight, by the way. People whose BMIs are in the overweight range do not face an elevated risk of mortality. Um, and another thing that's really fascinating is that the mortality obesity relationship that does exist tends to decrease with age to the point that when we're talking about elderly people, extra weight is actually protective. So people, older individuals who are overweight or obese are at uh, lower risk of mortality, not higher risk. 
One of the other uh, potentially surprising findings in the book uh, that comes from Paulina Valido's chapter about advertising is that over the last 30 or so years, uh, the amount of food advertisements that kids see on TV has actually been declining. Now, they may be getting exposed to more on the internet or through video games, but TV ads to kids, with respect to food, uh, kids' exposure to those have been falling. On the other hand, there's a lot of findings that are incredibly robust, that when you look at the literature, you're just struck at the percentage of studies that find the same thing. So one of the more striking uh, findings concerns discrimina discrimination against the obese. It's been documented in an incredibly wide variety of settings. Um, and uh, this is the subject of Rebecca Poole's chapter. So one of the more sort of eye-opening um, studies found that when you survey men about who they'd like to have as a sexual partner, that obese women are rated lower than women who are mentally ill and women who have sexually transmitted diseases. So that's probably its own punishment, I assume, right? If guys have those preferences. Uh, another really striking uh, finding is that obese children tend to score lower on tests, and this is remarkably robust uh, across ages of children, grades of the children, and even the, the subject of the test, whether it's science, math, reading, and so on. Um, and then another really striking finding are just the really startlingly good outcomes associated with bariatric surgery. So bariatric surgery is a really radical surgical intervention for obesity where they reduce the size of your stomach to about the size of a walnut and then bypass, take what's coming out of the stomach and bypass most of your upper intestine and route that, uh, those, the, that food down to the lower intestine. And so this gives you negative feedback about eating in two ways. First of all, your stomach just isn't very big anymore. So if you eat more than a few bites, you're going to have to vomit. And then second of all, when the food comes out of your stomach and hits the lower intestine, which isn't used to being exposed to, to rich food, you get diarrhea. And so this is something that in its extreme is called dumping syndrome, where you're just evacuating out both sides. And so it's incredibly negative reinforcement about eating. But what's amazing about bariatric surgery is uh, the studies that have found that almost all patients that get bariatric surgery, their type 2 diabetes has resolved before they leave the hospital after the surgery. So incredibly rapid disappearance of diabetes. And so better understanding, like, how is that possible when the person's still morbidly obese? Uh, how can the diabetes resolve so quickly is really just a striking question for, for future research. Another thing that's really interesting is how oftentimes the same rule does not apply to everyone. There's really diverse outcomes across subpopulations. So for example, we've all heard this saying that the poor are more likely to be obese. Well, actually, that's only true for women. It's not true for men, and it's not true for children until girls get to be a certain age in developed countries. And there's a different pattern altogether in developing countries. Another interesting finding that, that um, affects different populations differently is street connectivity. So this is basically the question of do you live on a cul-de-sac or uh, can you walk to all sorts of different places from your street? And so if you're an elderly person or an, or, or an older adult living in an area with high street connectivity, that's associated with higher physical activity because you can walk more places. If you're a kid, street connectivity is associated with lower physical activity, perhaps because your parents don't think it's safe to let you go out biking in the street, which they might let you do in a cul-de-sac. So the same aspects of the built environment can affect different groups differently. And then finally, in the chapter on mental health, Ellen Granberg documents that the relationship between obesity and depression uh, really varies by age, by gender, race, even, even nation. Uh, and so also by the severity of the depression. So for example, you know, being stressed out at work or being a little bit depressed about something can lead you to eat more, but the death of a loved one can lead you to stop eating for days. And so what is it that explains that sort of nonlinearity in effects? So now I just wanted to take a few minutes just to describe the, the production of the book itself, uh, because I found this fascinating, because it was the first time I was involved with a publisher and was putting together a book like this. So the way this came about is I just heard from somebody else that Oxford University Press was starting a handbooks and economics series. And so I got the contact information for the editor at Oxford and just called him out of the blue. And he encouraged me to submit a book proposal. And they had it peer reviewed, and they decided to go ahead with it. Uh, as I mentioned, I was really happy that almost everybody that I approached to contribute a chapter was willing to, to contribute one. I think that just helped in getting other people to agree to the project. And it took about two years and five months from me first contacting Oxford to it being out in print uh, last month. And so I mentioned before how uh, I think it's really important for topics like obesity for people to reach outside their disciplinary silos and try and communicate with other types of researchers. But there's also real costs to uh, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary work. And this was really brought home by this process. So for example, 
uh, Oxford University Press, they were fantastic to work with. But one interesting aspect of their organization is they're organized by disciplinary silos. And so when I con contacted the economics editor and said that I wanted to do a book not just about the economics of obesity, but about the social science of obesity, where you'd get all the social sciences contributing, his reaction was, well, I don't know if we can do that. And so to get per we, had to, we had to get permission for the word social science to appear on the title, uh, like on the, on the book cover. And he had to get approval from five dis different disciplinary delegates. So I don't know what would have happened if all five of them hadn't signed off. I guess I would have been stuck having to write the economics of obesity with inexplicable contributions from other, uh, other disciplines. <laughs> and then it, uh, the sort of challenges aren't completely over because now it turns out that the catalogs that the publisher sends out are also organized by discipline. And they're sort of idiosyncratically deciding whether to include us or not. So economics is including it in the economics catalog. Uh, psychology included it. But sociology didn't or won't. And uh, political science may not. And my editor had to fight uh, uh, really hard just to get our book displayed at the political science annual conference, like at the table for Oxford. So I mean, everything's worked out great. And it's been a great experience working with them. But it's just really fascinating to realize that Publishers sort of recreate some of the same silos we have in academia, and so it's just this additional challenge to trying to do work across disciplines. I am just so grateful to Angelica Hammer, who works in my department, Policy Analysis and Management. She really did a heroic amount of work managing correspondence with 87 different uh, contributors. And there was um, some problems with uh, the typesetters that the project was outsourced to, and she just did a heroic job tracking down all the errors that were introduced and making sure they incorporated the changes. And I just wanted to read to you, we got a really, uh, I got a funny email from the production editor. So this is a woman who works within Oxford University Press, and she just wanted me to know how crucial Angelica's help was. So she writes, I wanted to, I, I meant to say a special thank you to you, Angelica, for all of your painstaking efforts in helping me with the proofs. Without you, I could not have gotten this title to press. And then in another email, she said, I just wanted to let you know how grateful I have been to have you with me all along. This was a difficult project. I truly think God landed me, your, divi your divine hands and intellect, to see this project through. And so, yeah, Angelica uh, really was just an incredible you know, contributor to all of this. And so that's just a fascinating aspect, I think, of the production of a book, is how important someone can be whose name like, isn't on the cover or even in the table of contents. And then it was also really nice, another nice Cornell connection is Sarah Catterall, who used to be a library in the Cornell system. I believe she used to work at Mann. Uh, she did the indexing for the book. And it was really important to me that I have an author index because I've sort of picked up that a lot of people flip to the back to see if their name is mentioned. And I wanted people to see that their name was mentioned and then buy the book. So Sarah Catterall just did an amazing job indexing it. And then uh, Amazon turned out to be a really fun source of uh, feedback and amusement in this process. So something that's really neat is Amazon, you can register as the author of a book, and then they provide you with the Nielsen book scan sales data. And so it's this really cool map of the United States broken up into 100 different sales regions. And it shows you week by week where your book is selling and where it's not. Um, <laughs> and then something else that was interesting about Amazon is somebody within Oxford contacted me to say, by the way, like when you log on and see that page for the book, it's going to say only six left, order soon. And just ignore that, because they, it's, it's not really true, and they're just trying to goose sales. So just to, just to uh, alert you to that. You did? Oh, OK. Shrewd. And so then when the, when the page first came up, you know how it says, um, you might also like, based on the page you're looking at? So when the book first went up, it said, you might also like The Hunger Games, which is that <laughs> post-apocalyptic novel. And I was like, oh, hunger. Hunger and obesity, right? And then the other one was Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And I was like, I mean, I can't argue with it, but just like, wow, I don't know how they knew that. Uh, and then uh, I looked on Amazon uh, this afternoon, and I saw that the book is currently number 53,794. So I like to think that I'm on the bestseller list. I'm just like really far down, you know? Um, so something that meant a lot to me is that uh, my brother-in-law, uh, John Lathrop of Fayetteville, New York, who's an artist, uh, designed the cover for the book. And so I don't know if you can see it from that distance, but what he did is he sort of thinly sliced maps and then wove them back together to show that sort of everyone in the world, we're all in this together. On the left, you can see rising obesity indicated by the sphere and then falling rates of skinniness on the right-hand side. So I just really loved the fact that I was able to have um, you know, someone I really appreciate contribute such an amazing cover uh, for the project. We also lucked out. We got a review in The Lancet before the book was even out. 
Um, my understanding is most of the time it takes like a year to get book reviews done, so we're very fortunate about that. And then something else that's just really gratifying is uh, getting emails from the contributors after they've received their physical book and uh, they're excited. So this is Sahara Byrne, uh, our colleague here at Cornell, indicating that she got her book in the mail. Uh, and so that's just another really nice sort of family uh, feeling that comes from the book coming out. So I'm happy to uh, take any questions. And it, I just wanted to say in advance, like if you, if you want any more information about obesity or this work, please do feel free to email me. Uh, my website is economicsofobesity.com, and the book's website is socialscienceofobesity.com. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.